who would have known last week when I talked about seclusion that here I'd be almost by myself, except for I've got Danny and Matthew and Mike helping me put this this broadcast together so that we can get together in some way this week. I want to share some scriptures with you today and just some things that we're all thinking about and dealing with. And I just want to say before we go into that, I just want to say your family's health and safety is more important than our schedule, our normal plans, our normal practices. It's even more important, as much as I hate to admit it, than getting a chance to see you and you getting the chance to see me in person. The safety of, and it's not just our church, it's also the community in general, our town and where you live and your families and your extended families. Slowing down the spread of this virus, according to the doctors in our church and many, many other health professionals, is going to require us all to slow down in a lot of ways that will probably be disruptive and uncomfortable. But we have to do it. And it'll mean that there'll be adjustments and they'll mean that there'll be things that we need to do to help each other. The problem is, is that if we all get sick at the same time, then we can't help each other. We can't even help our neighbors. We can't really be there to do the kind of work that we need to do. So we have to slow down. And these, these kind of things have happened before in other times in history, even in our country's history. But we don't have a corporate memory of it because it's been so long ago. But all of these adjustments that we're making as a church and as pastoral staff are to ensure that you're as safe and healthy as possible. And for especially for those of you that have some underlying risk factors, it's also to help our medical people not to have the services be overwhelmed. And we do need to pray for our doctors, for the ones that have especially helped us with making informed decisions like Dr. McElhaney and Dr. Falloon and many nurses and many other providers that are in our area who are going to work really, really hard and really are kind of in the middle of this dealing with people every day. We just really need to pray for them. I also want to really say that I appreciate many people have contacted me personally and said if they can help in some way, they want to. And we're going to be looking for ways to do that. There may be people who uh, can't get out or are uncomfortable getting out. And we'll try and do all we can. Others have asked specifically how they might be able to give because there's a high likelihood that some of you may be off work or other people. There may be financial impacts of this that people are not prepared to really sustain. Some of you may have to not work because you got to stay home and watch your kids. And we want to, if we all can really do as much as we can together, we can do a lot to help each other and to get through this in a way that is not just a witness for the Lord, but also much, much easier on the individual families and individual people. You know, uh, in a crisis, it's always kind of, it kind of tests us a little bit. It's a chance to learn. It's a chance to listen. It's a chance to serve where we can and how we can. It is um, hard in this time because it seems like every place we go, anxiety and fear come up in almost every conversation, every news feed, every situation that we encounter, you know, it's talk, talk, talk. And it's hard because it's, we kind of want to disconnect from it and think this just can't really be happening. Unfortunately, the truth of the matter may be in the middle someplace of some of the things that people say, and we have to sort that out together. But nevertheless, no matter what, we still find ourselves being tempted to be really anxious. And we find ourselves being pretty fearful because some of this can seem pretty scary. And this can be hard on your family. And we know that stress can be really hard on your health. It's really important that you and I know how to deal with unnecessary stress in a way so it doesn't, we don't lose our ability to really maintain our perspective. We need to learn how to be calm 
and tranquil in the middle of a situation, not just when everything's easy. The most important thing you can bring and I can bring to to my family is a peaceful, tranquil heart. That has so much power in dealing with the people that matter to you and the people that depend on you. You know, the book of Proverbs I was reading about three weeks ago um, really, really spoke to me on this issue. And it is just like the Lord to kind of tell you something ahead of time so that you can ponder it. And here's what the passage says. It's in Proverbs 1430. A tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bones. You know, after all that's going on, I have to ask myself, and, I, and you have to ask yourself too, a hard question. Do I have a tranquil heart? Do I have a peaceful heart? Because we really need to have that, and I want that for myself, and I also want that for you. But you know, we really need God to help us with that. Because when things are, are stressful for reasons that are not just imagined, but real, it's easy to become super stressed. I try and picture my heart in a way that I can, like what would my heart look like if it was tranquil? And the picture I come up with is the, this picture. Now, some of you will recognize the picture from Man Camp. This is a scene that many of our men have looked at, and many others of you from Packwood Lake. The lake is smooth and tranquil, not a whisper of wind. Beautiful, reflective. And Jesus, I think, wants us to have that kind of heart. And he does offer us that. He says in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And then he goes on to say in, in John chapter 16, 33, These things have I spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. <laughs> But take courage, I have overcome the world. Now, I know that I've spent a lot of time, and maybe you have, worried and needlessly stressed. It's easy for me when I sit still to just kind of let my mind run and begin to think about this or think about that, and pretty soon I'm, I'm feeling pretty tense. Sometimes I'm not even aware of how that tension creeps in. It's easy to have a heart that looks more like this next image, now, you'll see that you can't get much, from, much of an idea of tranquility from it. There's not much reflective. There's just turmoil. I don't think that's the kind of reflection that we need to have, the kind of image in our heart. But unfortunately, it is sometimes true. And it's easy to go there. The tranquility of heart will control what our life reflects. If we have a tranquil heart, it's going to come out. It's going to come out in our words. It's going to come out in our face. It's going to come out in the tone of our voice, the caution in our voice. So the question I have to ask myself sometimes, and I want you to maybe do it today, maybe those, if there's some people watching with you, they would, you could talk about this afterward. What is your life reflecting? What does the surface of your life look like? You know, out of the abundance of out of the the abundance of our speech, that's what it shows our heart. It tells us the more tranquility we have in Christ, the more peace and love will be reflected. The more of Christ's reality will be reflected in our lives and through our lives. But when we get blown to and fro from this thought to that thought, this idea to that idea, all these things just stressing us out, it could be, it's like passion. It could be envy or anxiety. It just makes us so stressed. And, and Proverbs 14 says, it's rottenness to your bones. Undealt with stress has a terrible effect on us. As a matter of fact, I was reading, I was actually looking in the mirror and I was noticing, man, my hair's really getting gray. And some of you that have known me for a long time have been 
watching that steady march. I was reading these recent researchers were talking about why people's hair goes gray, and they've always assumed that it was caused by just aging. But they were trying to figure out if that was true, why do people sometimes in their 20s and early 30s, well, they go gray early and in many cases go gray very quickly, maybe in weeks or, or months. And what they discovered, and of course this is not true about everybody, there's many, I'm sure, exceptions to this, but they discovered that there is a biological mechanism in humans that when they are under incredible amount of stress or trauma, the chemical reaction in the system actually affects your hair. It actually makes you go gray. And of course, what they discovered was that going gray is more correlative to aging than caused by aging. So you would say, well, then why am I gray as I get older? Well, we live through enough things. We have a lot of stress. And sooner or later, it's going to begin to show up. You see, we have understand, we understand that um, this living for a while, living through even thing, times like this and other things that many of you have been through, it affects us. Like in your case, you may feel like, man, I just don't think I can, it doesn't seem like I can concentrate. I just feel so scattered. I can't focus. That can be caused by stress. Insomnia. You know, um, sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I get stressed, I can't stay away from the refrigerator. Even our blood pressure goes up when we get stressed. Some people get depressed. Some people, their skin breaks out. All kinds of physical problems come from undealt with stress. Not only that, but pain and sometimes autoimmune issues. Sometimes neck aches and headaches and stomach aches. We also know that heart disease is related to people that are under tremendous amounts of stress and, and whether they handle it appropriately. It can actually slow down healing if you have stress in your life that isn't handled well. You know, the Bible tells us that living by passion, living with those hot emotions of always driving and being filled with envy or anxiety or anger, can be really, really damaging to our physical bodies. As a matter of fact, Proverbs says, passion is rottenness to your bones. It may kill you. And unfortunately, may make other people want to kill you too. <laughs> you know, it's just the way we are. We're not usually at our best self when we're all stressed out. So how can we have a tranquil heart? I want to give you five things that I think could really help. Number one, Make tranquility and peace the new measure of your life's value. Not money, not power, not influence. Make the measure of whether your life is good, whether you are tranquil and peaceful and content. Paul said it like this, having food and clothing, I've learned how to be content. I've learned how to live a tranquil life. I've learned to be peaceful. Secondly, Make being aware of your inner mountain lake a priority in your life. You know, the Bible says that we ought to be aware of our inner life. Psalm 42 says the psalmist is asking his own heart before God, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? It's important to do it. Make that a priority, being aware of, what would my lake look like right now? Would it be a raging, white-capped um, chaos? Or would it be that nice, flat, tranquil, reflective lake? Number three, make tranquility and peace your measure of God's presence. Do you have peace? You see, sometimes that's a little bit more challenging. And so we replace that measure with, oh, I'm super busy. I'm doing all kinds of stuff at church or I'm doing all kinds of activities in the community. But you have to make peace and tranquility the measure of is that God is really with you. You have peace. 
in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm giving you peace, not like the world gives you. So don't, don't use activity or knowledge or religious responsibilities as your measure of whether God's working in your life. Make peace that measure. You know, sometimes we hear people say, sometimes there are people, they, there are people who profess their faith and they'll say, oh, if I didn't have the Lord, I couldn't do this or that. I couldn't be a um, professional athlete or I couldn't be a very, very wealthy person I, or I couldn't have all this responsibility. But the reality is, is that many, many, many people in the world do all kinds of things without God. They they make billions of dollars. They play professional sports. They don't have God. But I'll tell you, there's one thing you can't do without God. And that's do all those things with peace. God's the author of peace. That's where we get it. And, and if you want to do, see something and be impressed with something that only God does, it is a person who walks through the middle of challenging times with peace. So there's one thing that we need to lean to and lean into is our need for God to make our hearts tranquil. And then fourthly, make a plan to have a life of peace. In other words, sometimes I know I do this. Oh, can I work this in? Can I, I'm going to make choices. I, I got to get this person here and I got to make this and I got to do this. And we set our life up so it's impossible for us to really have peace. We are making all kinds of choices based on whether I can possibly make it happen rather than can I do this possibly and have peace. So you ought to make peace part of your planning. Okay, this might take me an extra day to do this with peace. Or I might not be able to cram all these things in. Or maybe we as a family can't do all of these things at the same time if we're going to have a peaceful family. So, you know, there may be things that need to be done. But you have to plan with a goal to do them with a tranquil heart and with a peaceful heart. And then, fifthly, Make praying for peace your breath. Make praying for peace like breathing all day long. Proverbs, or if Philippians says it like this, and a lot of you know this verse. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Wouldn't that be great? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Boy, that's, a, that's very inclusive, everything, nothing. It's pretty absolute. But then he says, pray about it. And then there's a promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You will find yourself with peace you can't even explain to yourself. You'll find yourself being calm when you normally would be quite upset or quite stressed, you'll have his peace that's beyond comprehension. It's a promise. And don't say it won't work until you do it. Now, this is how we pursue peace with God. We're pursuing that peace. We're going to God and saying, God, I really need you in my life. I need your grace. This is how you pursue peace even with yourself, you're in turmoil about different things and you bring those needs, everything to God and you cry out to him. And this is even how we can learn how to pursue peace with other people. Sometimes we don't need know what to do. We don't know how to handle it. We go to God and say, how can I handle this relationship? How can I resolve this conflict? How can I cooperate with these people? Now, you can let pride keep you from peace. It's really easy to happen. You can, it can keep you from having peace because you're unwilling to let things go. You're sometimes unwilling to forgive, or sometimes you're unwilling to just trust God's forgiveness for yourself. Sometimes we lose our peace because we don't ask forgiveness. We're just not willing to do it. We can allow our hurts and disappointments. We can allow our frustrations to 
keep peace out of our life, to steal it from us, to strangle us from, into a kind of chokehold of anxiety. And this just keeps the storms raging in our inner and outer lives, and it's just not worth it. Time is too short for, to be wasted on such things. I'd like you to take some time out today. You know, one thing we could think about with some of the slowdown that we are going to have to make, at least most of you, maybe you especially, is that this could be a type of Sabbath in a way, that you use it as a time to spend with your family, to spend with God, to spend out in his world, to slow down. You know, the Bible tells us there's a great promise. Be still, stop striving, and know that I am God. Take time to be before the Lord, and you could go outside and maybe read this verse. I, I shared this with my, my um, small groups last week. Psalm 62, verse 1, My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation my stronghold, I shall not be greatly shaken. I really love that last phrase, I shall not be greatly shaken. I got it, man, I'm I'm just like you, I get shaken too, I get kind of stressed. But you know what, the difference between being shaken a little and being greatly shaken is immense. The book of Hebrews tells us that when everything that is shakable is shaken, the unshakable things will remain. You know what will happen? When you trust him, you will not be greatly shaken. Wait for him. Listen to him. He's your rock. He's above everything. He's your stronghold. You can run into a relationship with him and he'll keep you safe. The more tranquil your heart, the more healthy you'll be. The more happy you'll be. The more holy you will be. As a matter of fact, I've been told the more beautiful you may be, especially if it's the beauty of holiness and you, because you're going to reflect the presence of Jesus, just like that mountain on the lake is reflected beautifully. Sometimes when you're looking at such a scene, you are unsure which way to turn the picture. You know, the more tranquil our hearts are, the more clearly they reflect the person of Jesus. I want your heart and my heart to be like that first image I showed you, that it would very clearly shine forth. And I want your life and my life to be less like that second image, that storm, that constant turmoil, that, that raging ferocity that sometimes comes in times like that. You see, especially in times like this where there is plenty of that already going on. There's plenty of stormy people running around, storming around. In times of crisis and uncertainty, we really need to be people that are tranquil. You do. We all do. And we got to help each other with this. You see, here's the thing. God's grip on you is certain. And as one person told me a long time ago, when we fear about things like this, remember, you are indestructible until God is done with you. So let's remember, tranquility comes with peace. And peace comes with Christ. And Christ comes ultimately when we surrender. It's true, we have to start someplace. And we start with surrendering. Someone one time said the only real struggle that we win by surrendering is the one that comes in our relationship with God. We surrender what we know about our situation and our lives, what we're dealing with. We surrender everything about that, everything we know about ourselves and everything we know about Jesus. We surrender our fears and our worries and our guilt and our grudges. We do what we need to do. We do the things that are required oftentimes, not always because we like it. We do what needs to be done to safeguard ourselves and those that we love, especially in times like this. It's our duty. We have to watch out for the people around us. It's important. 
But God will give you his peace as you give him your heart. This is what Second Thessalonians says, and I want to share this as my last verse to really share with you. Chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. Continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. He will be if you come to him. So think of what you're carrying right now. Think of what you're carrying, what you're dealing with. And lay it down before him. Lay that burden down. Cast your burdens upon him because he cares for you. And think of that. Remember what I said. The only war you win by surrendering is the fight we create with God over control. We're trying to hang on to it. We're trying to fix it. We're trying to figure it all out. We can't. Peace comes when we leave it all quietly to God. And you can do that. That's the one thing you really can do in the middle of think times like this. So please consider the following responses. And I, we, we want you to know, I know that Danny does and Mike does and Scott does and everybody in the TFBC family. We want to know, no matter where you are, even where you are in the world, we want to know what we can do and how we can pray for you and maybe pray for people that, that you are concerned about. And so here are some next steps that you may want to consider. First one would be, I am, cons- I am surrendering to Jesus as Lord and Savior for the first time. If you've been holding off to really trust Jesus for yourself, now's the time to do it. You know, nobody can do that for you. Nobody can force that upon you. (laughs) This is a voluntary choice to say, Lord, I really can't handle this, and I don't want to handle this on my own. I need you to be my Lord and Savior. I need you to take over my life. I trust you that you died for me and rose again, and you're all out ahead of this. I don't have to fear the future because you're already there. Secondly, I want to follow Jesus by helping others in this crisis. That's an important step for you to take. And you might want to list somebody or something you are concerned about or that we should be concerned about. And then you might say, well, I've decided to follow Jesus by being baptized as soon as possible. Now, we're not totally sure when that can be, but we If you indicate that and you want to do that, we'll try and work with that in the middle of the context that we're dealing with. And then you may say this, like a number of other people have contacted me. I want to start giving online to help others. And the link is provided. If you would just uh, pay attention, it'll be up here and you can um, get a hold of that. And um, and we'll try and make it as simple as possible for you. You know, like I said, there's going to be a lot of people who have a lot of needs, not just in our own church, but other people in our community. This is a great opportunity. And by the way, what better way to get the focus off of ourselves than to take the resources that God has placed us. Maybe you have a greater abundance and we take that abundance and we put it with those who have a less of an abundance. That's just really the way of love. And so let me really encourage you to give beyond your normal tithe and give something extra. And uh, you can do that online. Um, You can do that. There's other ways it'll be explained for you. You may need to drop it in the mail or you may have another way. You may call and check, make sure that somebody here will try and take it from you. If you want to do that, you have a concern. Maybe you have some questions about it. And then, If you're willing to serve people who need help, you can let us know here. You could maybe um, write a comment that would make it possible for you to like, look, I'd like to help in this way. And that may also give us some ideas of ways that we can actually help. And if you have a need, we want to do all we can to not only meet your needs, but those around you. So as this crisis um, goes on, there may be people that, have some real big struggles. They're affected. And so uh, we just really want you to be able to participate in that. And to be honest with you, it's going to take all of us to do our part as a body. You see, we let our good works reflect the reality of Jesus in our life. And you know what Jesus said? Let your good works shine before men, that they see those works 
and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what we want to do is we bring him glory. Well, I thought that I would uh, play this song I've played for you before. It seemed kind of fitting, and I know that it's, it's not super... Um, um, it's, it's kind of a little bit cheery, and maybe we need a little bit of that, but it's got a good, a good message. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow. Come on, guys. Strength for today and help all the way and all that we need for tomorrow. Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All you have to do is follow. That's what we have to do. We just follow him. We trust God and do the next thing. One more time. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. Come on. All you have to do is follow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All you have to do is follow. Strength for today and help all the way. And all that I need for tomorrow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All you have to do is follow. I couldn't hear you sing, but I'm hoping that you were really making a noise, making a noise, all right? God bless you. We love you, and we'll be praying for you.